So that being said, Rob, it's all you. Guys, I'll see you. I'll be around throughout the night. Let me know if you want to tour. Great. Awesome. Well, it's good to be here. It's nice to be have a, a good crowd. School of the Artists due today, uh, talking to some of the, uh, the, the artists. Oh, it, was, it was quite funny, we were meeting up with the artists this morning. Uh, I don't know, when I think of art, I still kind of think of paint. Uh, these artists, the first, uh, first thing uh, they presented to us was talking about how they re-implemented a C++ library. And I was, I was a bit like, uh, I'm sorry, I was, I was expecting you to be doing like things with lights, not uh, things with uh, libraries. Um, can you, can you really check cool. the yeah. light? Is that, oh, I think I missed it before. Is that better? I don't know. You're not talking. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Good point. Yes. Um, so yes, yeah, so we've got a whole bunch. Of, I, I think I passed some stickers around. There's a whole bunch of stickers going around. I've got some bigger stickers as well. Um, I've got some other goodies. Hopefully, some people have some projects they can talk about. Has anyone here got some Raspberry Pi projects that they want to show and tell a bit later? Any projects? I can see there are. Yes. Um, so we've got some T-shirts and stuff to give away. Um, so the best thing is, as part of this tour, we can have like a, uh, a grand prize. So uh, at each event, we're going to give away uh, a T-shirt to the best project of the night. Uh, we'll judge that in some way I haven't quite thought of yet. Probably like uh, whooping or something. Um, and uh, and then out of the, after the end of the entire tour, we're going to have a grand prize to give away uh, for the best sort of hack or Raspberry Pi project we've seen. Uh, and that's going to be one of everything from the swag store. So pretty much everything that we have, Raspberry Pi merchandise, uh, one of all of that, and then one of all of the Raspberry Pi products that we make. So that's a pretty sweet prize. Um, so uh, the competition is definitely on for that. Um, so first of all, who here has a Raspberry Pi? Great. And who has no idea what a Raspberry Pi is and has turned up because they want to find out? Good. Okay, that means that that's, that's an easier starting point. So, uh, so my name is Rob Bishop. So I was the first employee of the Raspberry Pi Foundation. Uh, the Raspberry Pi Foundation, as you probably already know, is, a, is an educational charity. We're based in Cambridge, back in the UK. And uh, we uh, set out with the aim to, to promote computer science. You know, the overarching uh, goal of the Raspberry Pi Foundation is to get uh, more kids to do computer science. Uh, and to do that, we, uh, we make this. It's a, a bit of a weird business model. We're both sort of simultaneously an engineering company and also a charity. Um, but we make this, the Raspberry Pi, and that is the tool with which we're hoping to uh, inspire and engage kids to, to come and do computer science. So uh, for those of you that don't know, uh, I'll talk a little bit about the, the history of, of where we came from. So obviously most of you are probably familiar with Eben Upton. Uh, he's uh, credited as being the, the founder of Raspberry Pi Foundation. Uh, he used to work at the uh, Cambridge Computer Lab. He used to be uh, Director of Undergraduate Studies at, at St. John's College in Cambridge. Uh, and really, Raspberry Pi came about because the academics at Cambridge were noticing that they were getting fewer and fewer students applying to do computer science. Um, and that's a really bad thing. Uh, I mean, not only was he getting fewer students applying, but actually the knowledge that they were coming in with was lower. So, um, you know, maybe 10 or 20 years ago, they were coming in with sort of assembler, you know, knowledge of processor architecture, a little bit of uh, a couple of uh, different programming languages. You know, you are now getting kids signing up who sort of had made a web page and, and thought that that was all that there was to know about computers. Um, and that was quite worrying. Um, it's, it's a really bad thing if we have fewer people doing computer science. So if you have fewer people applying, that means we're going to have fewer graduates. If you have fewer graduates, that's fewer people going into industry. Uh, it's bad for the economy because we're, we're not producing tech. Uh, it's, it's bad for the industry. And it's, it's really bad for us as geeks because we get less cool toys to play with. You know, we need people to keep making cool toys for us. Um, and so they went away to try and figure out why it was that, that people weren't, uh, didn't have these skills anymore and, uh, and why they didn't think computer science was interesting. Uh, and what they realized was that uh, our generation had grown up with different kinds of computing devices to sort of Eben's generation. You know, uh, who here grew up with sort of Spectrums or Ataris uh, back in the day? You know, I, I, we've, we've moved from the point where we had these general purpose, very accessible, very exciting uh, computers that you hooked up to your television through to sort of my generation which grew up with Xboxes. <laughs> you know, and while an Xbox 360 uh, has more uh, computing power in terms of flops than a, a 1990s Cray supercomputer, um, 
you know, Microsoft kind of don't want to sell you it on that basis. Uh, we've got to the point where these computing devices, despite having uh, really impressive silicon in them, despite being very powerful, uh, they're being sold based on, uh, on the games. You know, Microsoft ideally don't want you to have any idea what's inside the black box that is the Xbox. You know, they just want you to use it as a method to sell you their, their AAA type games. Uh, and actually, as games have got better, they've also got further away from our, uh, being able to understand how they work. So whereas you know, on the spectrum you might be able to go and program up a bit of wireframe Star Wars or whatever, you know, now when you have these very complex physics engines which we're used to, you know, they're, they're almost, uh, it's almost unsustainable how to go and understand uh, how those work. Um, and so that was a really bad thing. So we wanted to understand uh, why this had happened. And what we realized is you know, we weren't going to be able to replace a games console. We weren't going to be able to replace uh, a home computer. You know, we weren't going to be able to uh, revolutionize our computing devices to try and bring them backwards, because that's not what we want to do. Um, but we realized that what we could do is we could produce an additional device that was more like the Spectrums that we used to have. It's more like the Ataris, that was uh, sort of a, a relatively open computing device that was purely there for play. You know, uh, we think Linux is great. We think creating and making and hacking is great. The problem is, is that you know, not many people, uh, or certainly not many parents, are very happy to go and let kids go and uh, install Linux on their kind of uh, you know twenty-five hundred dollar MacBooks or whatever. <laughs> you know, they want to uh, they want to make sure that that these machines, which we're dependent on for everyday lives, we're dependent on for uh, you know our banking, for our email, for our work. Uh, you know, we wanted to have an additional device that was purely for play, that we didn't have to worry about whether or not it still worked at the end of the session, and we didn't have to worry about whether or not we'd left it out in the garden monitoring uh, bird feeding, because uh, you know it, it was a device that was purely for that. So, so then uh, we came up with the Raspberry Pi. I mean, the Raspberry Pi uh, basically is a cut-down development board. Eben Upton, after he worked at, at Cambridge, went to go work at. Um, uh, at Broadcom, and while he was there, he was in charge of the, the processor architecture for the, the chip, which is on the Raspberry Pi. Uh, and he spent a long time thinking about how he could make this cheap additional computing device that, that he really wanted to, to put in, in the hands of kids to allow them to experiment and play. And he realized that the development platform we had for these, uh, these applications processors uh, was perfect. And so uh, he went away, he cut it down with Pete Lomas, he did a lot of the design, and uh, we ended up with Raspberry Pi. Uh, who here uh, signed up on the, the pre-order or tried to buy a Raspberry Pi on the day that we released it? Yeah, okay. So, so that was an experience. Melted down the website. Yeah, so, so we, we initially, when we uh, were coming up with the Raspberry Pi, we thought we might sell you know, maybe 10,000 in a year. We thought, you know, a couple of school kids are going to have it. We think it's a good thing to do. We'll go and do this. You know, we all had day jobs at Broadcom. We thought, you know, a bit of fun, why not? And then... Uh, BBC reports about it, suddenly people find out you can buy a computer for 25 bucks. And uh, we had 100,000 pre-orders. Um, I believe, uh, one of the Eben, uh, stories Evan likes to say is uh, we actually were um, trending in terms of uh, Google searches higher than Lady Gaga at the point of, uh, of release. Yeah, which was pretty cool. And the um, fact that it took six days to get a reply back from RS. Yeah, because we, we crashed all of their web servers, yeah. I was like, that was awesome. Yeah, it's, it's impressive. I mean, you know, uh, Farnell and Amazon sort of ship on Amazon, uh, sorry, Farnell and RS ship on sort of Amazon sale logistics. I think RS said that they ship 4,000 parcels a day or something. Um, and we crashed their web servers with demand for a, a computer that sort of like four or five guys had, had done in Cambridge, which was pretty cool. But we quickly realized that uh, we weren't going to be able to manufacture these ourselves. That's why we ended up in the, the partnership agreements that we are with Farnell and RS. Uh, who, who now manufacture it for us. And uh, as I say, it's about uh, 18 months later, and uh, we've sold over one and a half million, uh, which is crazy. Um, we, uh, <laughs> I, I mean, I mean it's, a, it's a very weird startup, because obviously, you know, Evan still works for Broadcom. You know, he still doesn't even officially, you know, we, we have an office now. I mean, we didn't for the first kind of six months of me working. Uh, you know, Evan was at Broadcom and I was in my bedroom, uh, which was kind of fun. Um, you know, we now have an office. There's still probably less than seven employees overall. Uh, there's three of us engineers full time supporting uh, one and a half million units, which is which is also quite fun. Um, you know, our our, our, uh, our website now has um, over 100,000 hits a day, uh, including both the blog and the forums. So it's you know it's it's really 
um, become a huge thing. And I think it shows that there was this latent desire to go and play with computing again, to go and make cool stuff. Um, who here's uh, used a Raspberry Pi to help teach kids? Who's, who's done anything with... Yeah. Uh, I, uh, well, my next door neighbor uh, back in August. After, after they became available and you could get them without, yeah. without waiting too long. So I gave it to him. I was showing him Scratch. I left him playing that evening. Uh, and he was like, and then I came back a couple hours later and he had this really, really long list of turtle commands. I said, congratulations, you've invented loops. Yes. Let me tell you how loops work and yeah. you'll have the computer do the hard part of doing the things over and over again. Yeah. Uh, I just checked with him today. I, 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 um, he, his mom says, yeah, I don't know what he's doing. I don't understand it now. <laughs> and apparently he's not a video game. Yeah. So he's, he's no, that's small, awesome. I mean, he's got a small turtle that hop, jump, jumps over obstacles. And, yeah. I, it's so cool that we, we're seeing that come through. Oh, yeah, I mean, we've, we've come to this point where, um, you know, you kind of have these, uh, these kids who've grown up with sort of iPads and stuff. And they're very familiar with the idea of consuming content. They're very familiar with the idea that they can play games other people have made. But actually, when you show them that suddenly they can make games that other people can play, like, it's really quite powerful, uh, and it's, it's pretty awesome. There are more people coming through. Sorry, guys. All around the corner. So that's awesome. And then, um, following on from the Raspberry Pi, obviously, recently, we've produced a camera. As I say, you know, the Raspberry Pi basically is, is like a cut-down mobile phone platform, um, the, the, which is how we can do it so cheaply. Uh, you know, a, a question we often get asked is, you know, obviously... Um, there's issues with, with the uh, various openness of bits of the processor. Um, quite often people say, you know, why did you choose that processor? It wasn't a case of, you know, we sat down with a clean room design and thought, you know, let's design a platform we're going to sell one and a half million of. It was a case of we had, we had a chip and we were able to make a cheap computer and we thought, yeah, $25 computer, that seems like a good thing to do. Um, so we went and did it. And now, uh, you know, we've spent a lot of money and time fixing various bits of it so that it works to a state where you can support one and a half million users. Um, you know, as, as many people know, at the beginning we had a lot of issues with USB. And uh, the, the uh, USB core, which is on this chip, uh, is, by, uh, is by Synopsys. And um, it's designs that can be used both as a, as a host and slave uh, USB controller. And obviously it's shipped in sort of hundreds of millions of units of uh, phones, always as a slave. And, you know, we shipped as a host because it says it works as a host. Sell one and a half million units. And, uh, you know, we approach Synopsys and say, actually, we've got some problems with it. And they're like, oh, that's great. Yeah, we've, we've never tested it that widely. Um, you know, <laughs> and, and things like that. Suddenly, when you're shipping that many quantity, you, you discover problems that you didn't know were going to be there. Um, yeah, exactly. I mean, we've, we've finally fixed most of the USB bugs now. Uh, you know, we're at the point where a lot of the early bugs we had through, like uh, SD card corruption on overclocking and uh, USB issues, are now just about fixed on the very top of tree, uh, which is pretty cool. Uh, recently, obviously, we've also released uh, Noobs. Has anyone here played with the new out of box software? So that, that, that was my baby. That's the bit that I've mostly contributed to, um, which I'm quite pleased with. And it's, it's an attempt to try and make. Um, uh, make it a bit more user friendly to actually get to the to the meat of learning computer science. Um, you know, yes, we want uh, we want kids and we want people to understand how computers work. But I'm not sure that trying to understand how to image like a block device like an SD card was the best lesson that they could learn first off. Um, so so we went away and tried to make that simpler. Uh, I don't know if you've seen the announcement today, but as of today, if you buy a Raspberry Pi uh, Model A or B. You can now buy an 8 gigabyte SD card with Noobs pre-imaged for five dollars, just <laughs> right as, as an extra, which is pretty awesome. Um, so it means that uh, now you can spend um, forty dollars or, or thirty dollars and buy effectively a you know an out-of-the-box platform. You know, you plug in your phone charger. Although yes, there also turns out not a lot of phone chargers are actually any good at all. But uh, that's another thing you learn afterwards, right? Um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. We knew the product launch was the, the yeah. weird one to test this out in mass. Exactly. Well, and it's, it's one of those things where. You know, you don't really think about it. You think, oh, mobile phone chargers. You know, if it says it's, it's 5 volts, then, you know, it, it should probably be good. That's, that's what they're doing. And, you know, we've seen phone chargers which say they're 5 volts and 7 volts. Uh, there's one, one Chinese manufacturer which made a, made a range of uh, micro USB power supplies from 4 to 7 volts, which were all just 7 volts. They just put different labels on them. Um, which is great. 
uh, you know, I mean, even Apple's having a hard time of counterfeit chi uh, uh, charges out in China, right? So you realize how much of a, of a difficulty that is. Uh, you know, between that and, and the proliferation of USB devices, you know, we have people going, you know, my, my USB aquarium doesn't work and neither does my $3,000, uh, you know, uh, audio amplifier. And it's like, you've got to support all of these things simultaneously. You have USB. So, um, yeah, a lot of those lessons we learned the hard way and have been kind of fun. But yeah, so, uh, so you'll be able to now buy uh, noobs, pre-imaged, hopefully should make things a lot easier. We're still working on noobs, there's lots of good stuff coming uh, soon which will make that, make that even better. Uh, obviously we also have the Pi camera. Um, as I was saying before, you know, this is a cut down phone platform. One of the things phones now have is, is a camera. Um, it's also pretty cool, I mean this is a uh, 5 megapixel imaging sensor. Um, so for uh, $25 you can now add uh, a 1080p stream to your Raspberry Pi. So effectively, um, for $50 with a Model A and a, and a uh, Pi camera, you can now go and build a high definition camcorder. You know, and, and stream that over the network if you wanted to, which is, which is pretty awesome. Um, the other thing which um, I, I think we've been discussing is, is obviously uh, we're looking at producing this without the IR filter, um, so that that's going to be able to allow you to do sort of night vision and, and wider uh, wavelength photography, which is pretty cool. Um, you know, it'd be interesting for time lapse of trees and that kind of stuff. So, so that'll be pretty cool. Um, and it's really great to see what, what people have been doing with it. I mean, who here has a camera? Anyone done any cool projects with it? Or have you literally just hooked it up and gone, oh, I can see myself on my television? Um, yeah, anyone done any cool projects? Do you want to share? We're, I mean, one of the projects working here at Pumping Station One is we're building a cooking place machine. Right. We're using Raspberry Pi as a controller with a light. But uh, we're looking at also the camera. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. Tiny G is the motor controller, Raspberry Pi is the um, web server. So You had the bird camera, right? Yeah, the bird camera. Sunset camera. And <laughs> the car camera. That's never a problem. What's the great thing about our supplies? Obviously, you know, we, we set out to have something that, that kids could use. And now suddenly, we, you know, every day we see a different project we would never have thought of. Um, but on the blog the other day, someone was using the camera as a light sensor for reasons I didn't really understand. And then put it in a public toilet. Um, <laughs> which seemed even worse of an idea, um, and then was using that to monitor whether or not there was someone uh, in the cubicle. They said they were using it as a... Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not sure that was the best way to design that system, I'm not going to lie, but, um, you know, it definitely shows that people have some inventive uses for this thing, um, which, which is kind of fun. Um, Security-wise, I'd put some masking tape on Yeah, yeah, yeah. It actually is a light sensor rather than... Yeah, I, I mean, or you could just use a light sensor, which might make more sense. But, but you know, I mean, I'm, I'm pragmatic. I'm an engineer. Not if you have a camera on your Raspberry Pi. Oh, on a Raspberry Pi for the second place, we also I put OpenCV on there. So yeah, that's. Image processing there on the Pi. That's cool. There's more devices. We then have uh, had the problems with the repeating keys and various like isochronous track work for audio and various things. And what was the, uh, the, the SD card issue that you mentioned? So the SD card issue. Um, I'm not actually sure how we solved that one in the end, but we, uh, we've uh, recently got uh, a guy called Jonathan on team who used to be Peem on the forums. I don't know if you're familiar. You know. Um, so it used to be, we used to have random SD card corruptions um, and they're, they're put in a, a kernel level thing. And, you know, by that, you were at the kernel level, you mean the Raspbian distro? I mean, uh, so basically an RPI update will, will get that. Certainly if you're on RPI update with a late top of the tree on the latest branch. Um, you know, it's one of those things where we don't have a great reach for testing. You know, we do literally write software and then end up shipping it to like one and a half million people. Like Noobs was quite scary. Uh, you know, we wrote the software for Noobs, uh, myself and Floris, who, who did uh, Berry Boots. Um, he, he, did, uh, he wrote most of the, uh, the work and, and kind of Gordon and I uh, spec'd it and, and packaged it. Um, you know, and that testing pretty much was done by about five people. And then, you know, you end up shipping it out on the hub to one half million people, and then you just kind of watch GitHub issues like a hawk um, for all the things to come in. Uh, and you know, there were a number of issues with noobs as we went through. Part of the reasons that the SD cards are only uh, coming out now is because we've got noobs to a stable enough point that actually it's, it's, uh, it's pretty good for public consumption. Um, but you know, it, it, we do very much realize that the Raspberry Pi is a community effort. You know, like you're saying, you're beta testers. You know, 
uh, you guys have helped us develop the software as much as we have. You know, we produced the hardware because that was the thing we could do. Uh, and then it was a case of, okay, hopefully we'll all agree that having a Raspberry Pi that we can get in the hands of educators is a great thing. So let's try and work together and, and fix this up and get it into a good state. I've always described it as, as disposable, breakable computing for kids. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and the rest of us. Yeah, and the great thing is, is that, you know, we all get value and learn from fixing things. And then, you know, the kids downstream will get value from having a, you know, reasonably reliable but, but well understood computing system. Um, you know, and that's, that's very cool. Uh, yeah, sorry. Well, cool. Yeah. Uh, I was just wondering, so since your release, how much have you had to tweak the hardware? Uh, or has it remained pretty much static? Yeah, so we've, we've gone through a number of hardware revisions. We kind of follow the, uh, the iPad model in that it's uh, pretty much like the new Raspberry Pi rather than different models. Um, so uh, I can't remember how many board revisions we've been through, uh, three or four, I think. Um, they've all been pretty much minor tweaks. I mean, uh, Pete Lomas did an amazing job. The, the first boards pretty much worked. You know, there was a, a couple of, an issue with the 1v8 net that didn't quite work. Um, we've tweaked some things with the polyfuses. Um, but, you know, they've all been very minor changes as we've gone along. Uh, to be honest, mostly to support use cases that we never expected. Um, you know, the board on day one, if you plugged in a USB keyboard and mouse and plugged it into a TV and tried to run Scratch, it was good. You know, it wasn't good if you wanted to power your USB aquarium or whatever. And, you know, we've, we've slowly realized that people are very keen on those USB aquariums, so we've put the effort in to go and make sure that those work. Um, and so, you know, we're, we're at the point now where you know, we really do support a wide range of things. I mean, you know, have to bear in mind that, uh, you know, our, our software and hardware team, we're supporting everything from building pick and place machines through to, you know, sending these out into the stratosphere. I mean, it's, uh, it's quite a wide ranging set of, uh, of, of designs that you're trying to support simultaneously. Um, but yeah, but it's, it's, it's gone very well. And, uh, and the camera as well, you know, pretty much worked first time. We've, we've been, we've had some very good hardware engineers who've uh, made sure we haven't got need to go through that many revisions. Yeah. With, with the, kind of going back to the kids, you know, disposable computing, with it initially being focused on education, um, and now it's kind of taken off and, and been embraced by everyone of all ages. Um, is there still a focus on education for younger kids, or is it kind of now you're uh, widening that that horizon yeah. of education? Or so that's a good question. So, so one of the common misconceptions is that uh, we designed this for education. And then uh, lots of hackers bought it, so we thought, yeah, education's hard, let's just sell it to the hackers, right? Which, which isn't true at all. I mean, firstly, we're a very different startup. You know, we, I don't have it. I'm the first employee, I have no equity. We're, Eben still works for Raspberry Pi, you know, I, we still have sort of normal engineer salaries. You know, we do this thing because we love it. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's not like the kind of startup where, you know, we're, we're going to pivot to try and make the most sales. You know, we set out with a mission, which was to do the education and to promote computer science. Uh, and that's always been our goal and it always will be our goal. Um, what we realized is that with a very small team, fixing a lot of these bugs and getting the software in place um, and getting all the supporting software in place. So things like uh, Pure Data were at the uh, Art Institute this, this morning and they were using things like Open Frameworks and Pure Data to do some really great projects. Um, uh, which in turn, you know, help us, help us with education. Uh, and that's what we're seeing is that actually, um, you know, the, the early adopters who've been those with the engineering knowledge, the hackers, the makers, the, uh, the industry actually, which have picked up pies for, for use in, in either offices or prototypes or whatever, you know, they've all fed back into the project. So if you imagine if we have a bug um, with, with something that's uh, sort of like a, a, a daily occurrence bug, you know, if a teacher hits that, they might decide to, to never use the Pi again. If a uh, professional who's using it in a pick and place machine or whatever comes across that, they're probably gonna go and fix it because you know, they want the pick and place machine to work. And so effectively, we then get um, all of this added value from all of this uh, extra developer time for free. You know, we, we effectively get all, you know, hours worth of free contract um, you know, specialist software um, sort of fixing um, as a result of the fact that it is in the hands of uh, people who are professionals and developers and hackers and makers. And so as a result, we end up with a more robust product that we can then use for the kids. 
So it's a very positive cycle. You know, equally, the more we sell, the better we get margins. Uh, you know, we make a little bit of uh, operating profit on the, on the Raspberry Pi. As it's not for profit, so it gets fed back in. So that means we have more money to invest in education and resources. You know, we've hired an ex-teacher to come be an educational dir director. And that's all really positive for our mission, but it's effectively being funded by, by, by you guys, which is a, which is a great thing. Uh, the other thing, of course, is that uh, we have to think about how we're going to inspire kids to do computer science. You know, I'm not sure sitting down and telling them that it's important for the economy and that it's a good career <laughs> is the way to do it, right? I think the way to do it is to show them robots which fire Nerf guns at people it doesn't recognize. That, that's a much better way of doing it, right? And actually, uh, it's the hackers and makers who make the really cool projects that when you then go and show to kids, they go, that's awesome, how did you do that? And you go, well, actually, I needed computing. And so it's a logical flow. You know, the way we find that it is best to inspire kids is to find something they're passionate about, get them to work on a project for it, and almost, you know, they pick up computing and, uh, and software just as an aside. You know, um, engineering is just the art of making stuff. We've got to a point where uh, engineering is more synonymous with math than it is creativity. And that's really sad, because that's, that's not the case. Uh, and, you know, the thing that the, the makers and the hackers are very good at is highlighting the creativity in electronics and computing. And I, I really think it's that which is going to uh, inspire and, and, and appeal to kids and to get them to come and do computer science, which is obviously our end goal. Yeah, so, so we're very careful about this. So what, what we don't want to do is build a curriculum around the pie. You know, we, we, we don't kind of want to end up like Microsoft, where people are teaching, you know, the pie, and the pie is part of the curriculum. What we want to do is have a strong computer science curriculum that you can do on a $25 uh, computer, rather than needing a, you know, $250 you know, dollar one. And, and, and that's, uh, that, I think, is very important. Um, you know, obviously, we're, we're spun out with Cambridge Computer Lab, so we're, we're linked with, with strong academics. Um, uh, there's a, an exam board in the UK that sets GCC, so kind of middle school examinations. Um, and they're actually in the process of producing a MOOC, uh, which has a bunch of videos that have been produced between the exam board, uh, our Clive Beale, our education director, and also um, the uh, academics at the Cambridge Computer Lab. And they've worked together to produce a set of videos, which is all you need, well, videos and, tuto and uh, sort of uh, tutorial sheets and, and, and kind of uh, online exercises which is all you need to go and pass their examinations in computer science. And so, you know, we, we are getting there with the resources. Um, the thing we found is that it took us a while to make the connections and to really understand how to do that. You know, I mean, our, our trustees uh, and, and our, our, our staff came from engineering backgrounds, came from uh, university academic backgrounds. And actually, obviously, you know, the, uh, the high school sort of education uh, sort of area is a very different it's a, you know, it's a very it's a very different sort of knowledge base and so we've had to go and pick up an understanding of how that works make the right partnerships and and really work through with that and that's been a lot slower you know it's a lot quicker to make a computer for us than it is to to go and understand how to do effective education links but but it is coming in the uk it's certainly there um in the us you know part of me being out here is to, to try and understand a little bit more about what the opportunities are you know i know there's things like uh, uh Coda dojo uh, first robotics and things like that, but equally trying to make sure that the uh, the curriculum has more computer science in it because that's you know it's obviously really important for our for our mission. Yep. I saw last week the new Chromecast from Google. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, oh man, they stole Raspberry Pi's idea. <laughs> yeah. Do you have any comments on what Google's doing there? So, um, so you know the Raspberry Pi runs Chrome, right? So, so um, we ported uh, uh, myself and uh, Liam McLaughlin, uh, Hexa who did a lot of the original Chrome stuff. Uh, we did port Chromium to the Pi. So if you, do, if you download open source Chromium, you can actually sli select Raspberry Pi as a build target and build a Chromium image. Um, it has a number of issues that we're, we're still kind of working on. But you, know, you can actually get WebGL working, for example, you know, and the, the browser works. Uh, you know, not at a great frame rate, but, but it's there. Um, and so uh, you know, we, we, we obviously have good links with Google through that, but also through uh, they sponsored us a uh, million dollars to, to give away kits in the UK to, uh, to kids. Um, I'm not sure that the Chromecast, you know, obviously it's not a competing product because that was never what we set out to do. Um, 
And it's still, I mean, I actually saw a project, I think it was, someone was tweeting about it, that someone had done a sort of Raspberry Pi equivalent um, using AirPlay or something on one of the XBMC distributions to do the same sort of Chromecast thing. Um, so I think, I think that'll happen. Um, you know, I still think the Chromecast is a pretty cool, pretty cool bit of kit, but I'm sure people will make their own open source alternatives. Um, Manufacturing background. How has this changed the image of manufacturing yeah. in England? Yeah. I mean, I've, I've heard that the, 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 your factories are mostly in England. Yeah. Well, all of the pies are manufactured in England. So, so the cheapest computer you can buy, uh, pretty much in in the West, certainly in the Western world, um, is manufactured in the UK. Has, has like, got would the you? Thinking about uh, manufacturing differently. Yeah. I mean, I, I think. It's interesting. I mean, I think one of the things we've noticed is there is a, a uh, massive improvement in quality between the ones we had manufactured in the UK and the ones we had manufactured in, in, in China initially. Um, yeah, go figure. Um, you know, it's also, it's, it's a Sony factory, the one in Wales. So, um, you know, they really are state of the art. They believe in, in all the continuous improvement. And, um, you know, they get really impressive uh, failure rates. I can't can't remember the percentile, but it's the, 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 the you know, we, we have virtually no failures in the factory, it's some tiny figure. Um, and it really is quite impressive. Um, and I think, I think it's a great thing. I mean, there's, there's definitely a move to, uh, for companies to manufacture things in the, in the UK and the US. I mean, certainly, something like Motorola producing that new phone in the, uh, in the US. I think it's, it's certainly something that's, that's going to happen, and I think it's a good thing. Um, I think it's important. So saying we also manufacture pies in China, but for the Chinese market. Uh, we realized that, that Raspberry Pi would end up being cloned, so we decided we'd go and make our own clones. Um, so, <laughs> which is, you know, kind of Evan's cunning there. Um, so uh, we actually make uh, a red pie, so it's a Raspberry Pi, but with a red PCB. Um, and that's uh, sort of China sales only, so it's, it's uh, barred from export. Um, which doesn't go through all the various conforming testing because they, they don't seem to bother so much about that over there. Um, and uh, and, it, and it's, it's priced for the Chinese market, and that's kind of stopped people from cloning us because we sort of did it ourselves, which is quite interesting. Um, although it hasn't stopped people trying to get hold of them so that they can collect all the different sets. I mean, it, it's kind of cool. You know, we did a run of uh, blue PCB ones, um, and they were going on eBay for like hundreds of dollars. You know, you get to the point where... People want to buy identical uh, electronics with different PCB cards. <laughs> and that, that's when you really know that, that hardware is a bit more back in fashion when someone cares about something like that. The jelly bean syndrome. It's like, you've got to have all the colors. Exactly. Well, it's, and it's like um, with the early revisions, I know we had a couple which had um, little uh, sort of hardware defects, which we then patched up. You know, and people have been going out trying to find the ones, you know, like version 2.1 or whatever, that, that had certain uh, issues so that someone can have every single pie ever made. And you're just like, yeah, that, that's cool, but, you know. Um, <laughs> you know so, uh, yeah, it's, it is interesting. And I do think, uh, I think personally, you know, uh, we got to the point where a lot of people had um, connections to sort of high-speed broadband, and suddenly we had like a boom in, uh, in sort of dot-com businesses uh, sort of 10 or 20 years ago. You know, we, we got to the point where we had a lot of people had smartphones, and then we had a boom on, on apps. I think we're pretty much at the peak of maturity of that, where suddenly, you know, you could write an app and it, it had this wide market base. I really think we're getting to the point where um, hardware is going to be the next uh, big thing in terms of uh, startups and companies. Because it's getting to the point where it's so cheap to manufacture your own hardware or, um, you know, computers or whatever that actually... I think we're going to see a lot of uh, startups which traditionally would have struggled to get the capital and to get started making uh, physical computing products that now can actually go and do that because, because it's got cheap enough. And I think we will see a, a boom in that happening as well. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I honestly think that's going to be the next, the next big thing because you know, all these booms were preceded by the fact that the technology was there and the market was there and I think you know, if we can sell one and a half million pies in, a, in 18 months, then it kind of shows that uh, that's probably a, the next market ripe to, to happen. Uh, what, what's the hardest question somebody asks you? Um, oh, it's usually when we end up... It's usually, what was your toughest yeah. question to answer? So it's usually when we end up with and debates, answer. debates over the GPU. Um, <laughs> it's the usual question. So, so the, the, the short answer on the GPU, right, is the pattern system is broken. Um, the, the problem is is that um, 
uh, for us to open up the GPU, you know, everyone wants to open up GPU. We want to open up GPU, Broadcom wants to open up GPU. As soon as they do that, to open it up, they have to release into the public domain information about how it works. As soon as they do that, they expose themselves to patent litigation, right? And so Broadcom effectively end up in a situation where they have a massive litigation risk for no financial gain. And so, unsurprisingly, you know, they're kind of hesitant to do that. You know, and, and, and that's because the patent system's so broken. I mean, it upsets me that we're at a state where uh, companies, when they develop things, have to hide it rather than share it because of the way the patent system's broken. You know, that's not how the patent system's supposed to work. We're supposed to be able to invent things and then share the knowledge and then still, reca you know, still recoup the costs that we're... we're were called, you know, created in, in order to produce that technology. Whereas now we have companies that produce technology and have to hide it under a rock. Which is, yes, the GPU is closed. Uh, no one likes it, but that's where we are. You know, there's nothing we can do about it. Um, so, so that's the short answer on the GPU. Uh, you know, and, and the other question then usually is, you know, how come we have this chip with this weird architecture where 98% of the die is GPU and you kind of coprocessor? And the answer is because you know, that's the thing we could make. Uh, you know, we didn't set out to do this. Um, people then usually ask, well, you know, you, now you can put any chip down, are you going to change it? Um, uh, and my answer to that usually is, uh, sort of look at the Facebook valuation and the Metcalf effect. If we have one and a half million people using a fixed platform, uh, we'd be pretty foolish to go and throw that away. Uh, you know, it's not perfect, but you look at the wealth of projects and code and and, and various open source projects, which is, are available for this architecture, you know, that's very valuable. And so we want to keep making the Pi in its existing format for as long as we can get the chips and Broadcom, frankly, because, you know, you do have all of this wealth. You know, it's great that you know, I was visiting uh, Argonne National Laboratory on Monday, and you have uh, guys who work on the fifth largest supercomputer in the world, um, who also have Pis that they're playing with, and then you go and see kids, and, and they're using the same hardware, you know, exactly the same hardware as you know, the uh, chief computational scientists at Argonne are using. That's really powerful. You, know, you can use the same bit of kit to, to, you know, work at, to, to do uh, data logging in Argonne as you can to hook up to a Nerf gun, as you can to you know, write a little scratch game. That's a really cool thing. Um, and that, you know, I hope, further helps to inspire kids. That actually, you know, with $25, and an internet connection, there's no reason why you couldn't, you know, create the next startup or code or whatever it is that, that was the next big thing. You know, all of the resources are available to go and learn. You know, you can go watch the OCR MOOC lectures. You can download uh, various, like, the, um, Learn Python Hardway. You know, all the resources are there to learn everything you need to go and create your own projects and create your own businesses. It's quite cool. Yeah. What's the current state of Android? Yes, that's another common question. So, so the problem with Android is, is that Google have done a very good job of making it look like it's open source. Um, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, and the problem is, is that actually, yes, obviously you can, you can get ASOP Android and the, 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 the sort of core is open source, but all the drivers you need to actually do anything, you know, sort of beneath Surface Fling or whatever, they're all closed. And so um, it, it's actually not that trivial to port Android to. Uh, and equally, you know, for the same reasons as everything else, um, you know, it, it's difficult to get Broadcom to release all of their closed code that they're using on their existing platforms. So I know there's a number of community platforms, uh, community groups who are going out to go and work on this. Um, I know there's a number of projects. Um, it's not something we're devoting any resources to. Uh, mostly because uh, you know we're we're obviously swamped with the stuff that we're trying to support anyway, but but also you know Android doesn't really fit with our our core values. Um, it's a content consumption platform. It's not a creation platform. I mean, yes, at this point someone points to an app where you know you can SSH into another machine or you can write a web page. That's fine. But you know what we really wanted is people to be able to understand the full stack of, of how a machine works. You know, we want people to be able to go and mess about at the kernel level and build their own kernels and do low-level programming. You know, we want that kind of visibility and understanding. And actually, that's not what Android's designed for. You know, Android is designed for you know apps and, and top-level user interfacing stuff. And that that isn't what we were, you know, setting out to, to try and try and introduce. You know, I don't think. 
the world needs, uh, or young people need, any more motivation to write apps. I think they need more motivation to go and learn assembler and, and to really understand how computers and operating systems work. And so uh, Linux is a much more obvious choice for that. Uh, you know, and if, if, if Linux isn't an operating system you want to use, you know, there's always Plan 9 or, uh, or BSD or whatever other crazy esoteric operating system you want to go play with. So do you know the state of the Plan 9? Yeah, it, I, I believe it works. I believe it's, it's, it's been fully ported. Does it like GBIO and all that stuff? I don't know what the device support is. I haven't really played with it that much, unsurprisingly. Um, but, uh, I mean, the list of supported OS seems to grow every day. Uh, you know, we're, we're working on noobs at the moment, and just the number of, the, the amount of resource on the mainstream OSs, just things like Arch and Raspbian and Pydora, the amount of work, the number of people working on those is, is incredible. Um, you know, they're pretty polished operating systems, you know, that, that are designed for, like, an educational computer we thought we'd make 10,000 of. You know, that, that, that alone is, is pretty awesome. And that all happened on its own. You know, we didn't write Raspbian. Someone else went away and, and did that for us. Uh, you know, when we first got the board up and running, um, uh, Evan and I uh, were the first people to, to get the, the kind of uh, Linux kernel booting on these devices um, when I was working as an intern for him. And um, we were first using Ubuntu. Uh, and then, of course, Ubuntu dropped support uh, for the V6 architecture. Um, and then uh, we moved across to Debian. And uh, the problem with Debian is that, well, most of the operating systems now, is that their ARM ports, they have a V7, that's a high performance, and they have a V4 that's kind of a catch-all for everything else, uh, usually soft, uh, soft floating point as well. And uh, so we ended up with this Debian on V4, and uh, some guys were like, yeah, this is really slow. Uh, and we've got like two increment increments on the instruction sets since then, and uh, this uh, you know hardware floating point unit we're just doing nothing with, um, and so they went away and rebuilt everything, um, and th they ended up doing Raspbian, which is the the kind of Raspberry Pi hard FP V6 port of, of Debian, and that was a community. You know the community did that. That's really cool, um, and it wasn't something that, that we expected to happen. So, I mean, judging by the number of sort of Raspberry Pi based robots, uh, you know, it, it feels reasonably mature. I mean, I, I, I would hazard a guess that most people who are building any kind of uh, amateur robot or even professional robot, probably the Raspberry Pi is going to be their their go-to device these days. I mean, there was uh, Ziphius Project, which was an uh, aquatic drone, so kind of a parrot AR, but for the water. Um, and that used a Raspberry Pi and a Pi camera and, uh, and a Wi-Fi dongle. And that was, you know, attached to it. And then they made their own sort of um, add-on board, which had a bunch of servos. And that was their aquatic drone. You know, and they've, they're now producing that commercially with a Raspberry Pi inside it. So you know, it's definitely, it's been done, and the, the work is definitely there. So, yep. Do you have a personal favorite uh, flavor of XBMC for Raspberry Pi? <laughs> um, probably not. They're all they're all pretty good in different ways. Um, so, uh, OpenELEC, um, OpenELEC is pretty awesome because they've they've managed to get the uh, the size of the the image to be very small. Um, they also uh, it's all GL rendered the the, the front end. Um, so it's, it's very fast and very fluid, which is very cool. Um, Raspberry MC, Sam Nazarko is a bit of a legend. You know, when he did Raspberry MC, he was 18. You know, that's pretty cool. And he just did that off his own back. He thought, hey, it'd be cool to have XBMC running. And he just went and did it. Um, and that has a really loyal user base and does some other great stuff. Um, I, I don't tend to play with the XBMC stuff much. Uh, I, you know, I mostly just test it to make sure it worked with noobs. And the great thing about noobs is actually you can chop and change as you want to and, and try all these things out fairly easily. Yep. As a follow-up to that, when you were talking about Android being a consumption, content consumption, yeah, yeah, yeah. how does XPMC fit into your, you know, the ideology of what yeah, Raspberry so, Pi is? So XPMC, it's interesting. I mean, uh, it's an obvious use for Raspberry Pi because of its, uh, its media capabilities. But, uh, you know, it's still kind of pretty cool. I, I think it's a good thing that, that, that we support it. We see a lot of people who buy Raspberry Pis and go, you know, I want to make a robot, but at the very least, I'll turn it into a media center. <laughs> and, you know, it's kind of not bad to have that, that, that dual use. I mean, if nothing else, all the XBMC work has been done by outside community. 
you know, as I said, you know, 18-year-old Sam Nazarko went and, and built Raspberry MC. You know, he was uh, doing computer science. He made a very good story about an 18-year-old who made some software that ships to millions of users. You know, that, that feels like that fits quite well with our mission of promoting computer science, actually. Um, whereas I'm not sure that Android needs any more adopters. Um, so... <laughs> Yep. You mentioned some of the changes to the Linux kernel before. How are you still managing that as a separate branch, and do you have any plans to mainline? The yeah, I mean we're, we're upstreaming where possible. Obviously, because of the uh, the way our, our architecture split is and the bootloader and stuff, a lot of that's going to be difficult to push upstream. But I believe in 3.10 there is sufficient support that you can boot uh, the Linux kernel on the Raspberry Pi in mainline. Um, uh, you know, and we're, we're we're pulling down stuff that we can. Um, we still we still try not to pull in out of tree drivers. We were pulling in some of the Wi-Fi drivers, but it just caused us headaches when we updated the kernel. Um, I don't know the state of Wi-Fi and the Linux Linux port on Wi-Fi still isn't great, um, but you know we're we're, we're working on it. Um, you know we'd certainly anyone who's working on a Linux kernel driver, we'd encourage you to upstream it, and we'll uh, you know catch it on upstream rather than pulling it in now and giving us headaches when we try and. We try and do stuff down the line. I mean, I can't emphasize how few people work on this. You know, Dom pretty much single-handedly manages the Raspberry Pi kernel, um, which is like one guy. Yeah, um, you know, and, and again, that's not even his day job. That's something he does on the side. Um, <laughs> you know, it's, I, I was the first employee because I uh, I should have been finishing my master's degree, and um, this seemed like more fun. And um, I, I was very cheap as a result of not finishing my master's degree. And so, uh, you know, that's how I started when I was... Uh, Did you finish your master's? No, I still haven't. I technically haven't matriculated a degree yet, so that's kind of fun. Um, but... Uh, Sounds about like you might go the Bill Joy way of, like, you know, uh, sidetracked by success. Yeah, we'll see. I think I'm on uh, indefinite hiatus or something through my indefinite intermission of studies. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll deal with that when it comes to it. It's kind of cool to like give a talk at Google and Apple and places that a degree as well, which is kind of fun. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'll finish it at some point. Um, what, what's happening on the, the future of Raspberry Pi hardware? I mean, are they going to fold Wi-Fi into it at some time on the board? Yeah, I mean, so... so uh, I mean, again, going back to the point of us being a small team, you know, what we're mostly trying to do is, uh, is fulfill all the potential of the existing platform. You know, as I said, you know, we don't want to go and, and change it um, suddenly. Uh, we don't believe that you can actually build um, a better device for, for this price point. Uh, we don't believe that any of the chips out there, you can create something that is as good as a Raspberry Pi at the price it is. You could do something for a little bit more, but actually th there's this kind of good enough factor. Um, most Raspberry Pi uses aren't actually uh, that taxing on the arm. You know, and you think a lot of the people, they're using it for, you know, taking a picture uh, every now and then or, you know, measuring a light sensor or having like a knock sensor. Actually, really, they're using the Raspberry Pi pretty much as a microcontroller. But because you can program it in Linux and because you've got the network access, you know, uh, it, it's a lot better than maybe using an Arduino for those kind of things. Although there's a lot of uses when Arduino still makes more sense. Um, and so as a result, uh, as a result, we have um, a lot of people uh, using the Pi for that. Uh, I forgot I lost my train of thought slightly. What was I? Um, the future of the Raspberry Pi. The future of Raspberry Pi, yes. So, uh, so yeah, this is good enough factor. And so, um, you know, actually, yeah, you, you, know, you could get a more powerful platform for maybe 10 or $20 more. But, but if all you're doing is taking a picture infrequently or measuring a light sensor, you just want the cheapest device because it's good enough. And so... Um, you know, I think, I think that's where the Raspberry Pi is really great, is that I don't think you could make a better device for the cost, and I'm not sure that a better device at a higher cost is actually a, a good value proposition for most use cases. Um, and certainly, you know, given the, the uh, media performance of the Raspberry Pi, you know, you'd have to spend quite a lot more money to get something that was as good on the media front. Um, and so, you know, actually what, what we'd rather do is work with third parties, um, who are making add-on boards and various other bits and bobs to, to extend the pie rather than folding it in. I mean, bear in mind also, we want to make this as cheap as possible for, for school kids. You know, we want to make this as cheap as possible. And so folding in more things and raising the cost, yeah, it might be better for the hackers. But that's not great for the, you know, the, uh, the, the kind of poor students or, or whatever that we're trying to get these in the hands of. So that's definitely true. So, so doubling the memory came about um, simply because 
uh, that you couldn't get hold of a um, of a uh, 512 uh, DDR2 um, die. It didn't exist. Um, and so actually, um, we got to the point where that did exist, and we started manufacturing it. And we were like, yeah, we'll do that. Um, and uh, you know, and we're, now, we're now capped at going any higher because that doesn't exist. Um, and uh, yeah, sorry, that, that's the other way around. So, we can't go any high. We can't go for one gig because it doesn't exist. We went for the 512 because, as you were saying, the, the prices had dropped to the point where we could roll that into the same price point. Um, going forward, if there's stuff we can roll in, we're probably going to look at doing that. Um, probably not major stuff, just, just minor changes. Um, what we are keen to do is to use the extra margin that we're going to make to be able to fold back into the educational purposes. So, you know, for example, the... Um, the extra bit of operating profit has allowed us to go and make the Pi camera. It's allowed us to, uh, you know, employ an education director. It's allowed us to, um, you know, have me do these kind of things where I go out and meet the community. And so, um, you know, actually, it, 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 rather than uh, always sort of changing the Pi, we'd rather keep the Pi as it is, keep the platform, make sure we have this common platform, and then use those funds to support it in other ways. So we have something to hook up to the CSI. What about the DSI? Yeah, OK. So we've been promising a display for a very long time. Um, the problem with the display is, is, is the, the camera modules are a lot easier to source than the display units. Um, it's actually we, we're, we're, we are struggling to find the right display unit at the right cost. Um, you know, again, you're kind of sourcing these things from China. That involves quite a lot of time. Again, with the, the thing that we're a small team, uh, you know, Evan, of course, has day jobs. We can't exactly go and uh, do lots of traveling to, to work on this. And so, um, you know, the hold up on that has just been finding the right, the right panel to do that. You know, we committed to doing it. It's going to happen. It's just a little bit slower than we'd like. Could a third party manufacture So, um, I don't believe so because of the way the uh, DSi driver works. It, I, I guess it could do if we put in software support for it software doesn't exist yet. There's, now, you could use the GPIOs to add your own LVDS display. Uh, people have done that. You could add in your own parallel display of the GPIO. People have done that as well. Um, but using the DSi port uh, requires certain drivers, um, which are in the Broadcom sort of firmware. Cool. Any more questions or projects that people would like to show? I'm hoping some people will have some cool projects. Well, one of our full projects is beer brewing, right. uh, which is monitored by Raspberry Pi, right. which is Eric? Eric Ford meeting. Right. I can talk about yeah. it, though. Oh, yeah. Uh, we've actually uh, got a uh, Raspberry Pi now set up uh, downstairs. If you want to see it, it's a uh, power and air conditioning, which shows this cabinet. We have a pin loop running, and it's also outputting to the web a uh, real time graph that has all the pin parameters, the temperature, and so we can keep our beer just the right fermentation. <laughs> You can hit that now that it's what chill mod, I think. We just, uh, we, I think we can change IRC. it around, but it used to be, yes, uh, we call it chill mod. Uh, we, can, oh, we put together our own hardware uh, for it. We can even get our own, uh, our own board to control the, uh, uh, the plugs into the pipe. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The, the other interesting thing you mentioned, you said you were at Argonne about being able to do uh, stuff, uh, the, the same stuff there. What's interesting is that they have this whole SCADA platform called Epics yeah. that they use to control the advanced photon source. It's yeah. open source. Yeah, we were, I was talking to the guy who uh, was, yeah, had written a lot of that. Because he was. hoping to eventually get a Pi running that and having it control like protein burners and pumps for like the mash process. Yeah, you should. Uh, if you email, if you emailed Argon and tried to get in contact, I, I, you know, the, the guy is very keen on his pies, and he's got Epics running on a pie, so um, I'm sure he would be. Uh, I'm sure with the offer of beer, he would probably be very keen <laughs> to uh, to come and help you out with that. Um, you know, it is great that uh, you know we have everything from hackers to to really, uh, you know, high level computer scientists, uh, you know, who are passionate about the pie. It's it's a really great thing. You know, it, it's it's cool when. Um, you know, people working at like Google and Apple or um, Argon who you know go, oh, cool, Raspberry Pi. Yeah, we'd love you to come and uh, to come and talk to us because we have pies and they're great. That's it's pretty cool. Um. I think our uh, well, our CTO is also in the board meeting, but I believe our access control system has a pie in it, right? So the RFID um, entry access. I, I don't know. Okay. I'm not sure. So I, I believe there is one in there. We we don't quite have it. At 
yeah. working yet, but the idea is to have RFID in the building. Um, and there was also um, our president had presented at our um, we have a bi-weekly meetup for embedded systems. Yes. Um, we do a lot of pie stuff, and our president had presented a system where he had an IRC bot hooked up that could announce in different rooms. So you say you want to announce something in this room or that room. So basically, had some audio jacks and some relays hooked up to the Pi with some Python software. So you could tell the IRC bot to announce in the electronics lab that hey, we're leaving from the we're, we're leaving the shop downstairs. You guys are the last ones here or whatever. You know, yeah. that sort of thing. That's very cool. That was also using zero. Zero MQ. Yeah. Zero MQ. Yeah, and that we also said Raspberry Pi was doing the voice synthesis. Yeah, with the uh, festival. That's right. Yeah. 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 Any other cool projects people want to talk about? Yep. Uh, uh, one of the issues that I have as in as a, as a trainer in teacher is trying to find some way to get engaged with schools and kids and the Raspberry Pi. Yeah. And I my impression is that there's less happening here in the US than in the UK. But yeah. did you have any thoughts on that? So so it's interesting one. So I think part of it might just be familiarity with the various schemes. So as I say, it's taken us a long time to get up to speed with, with how the, the British education system works and to understand the right people to talk to and to understand how to create the right kind of materials that are helpful for that. Um, obviously, you know, when we then start looking worldwide, you know, we really don't have enough resources to start then trying to understand you know, everyone else's school boards. I mean, particularly in the, the US where you know, uh, because it, it seems to be controlled by individual states, you end up having to have sort of 50 conversations rather than one as well, which, which makes it even more tricky. So, you know, ideally what we'd want to do is, is work with um, groups uh, that, are, that are in the US that are helping out schools. So, to give you an example, back in the UK there's Code Club, which uh, provides after-school uh, sort of coding sessions for schools. And, and what they do is they... Uh, they have a bunch of resources, they link up with uh, local uh, sort of experts or, or, or programmers or hackers or makers, and they come into the schools, they teach these classes, and they do it sort of not as part of the curriculum, but just as something the kids can do, it's fun, you know, they then have their own Raspberry Pis, and you're just kind of exposing them a bit to uh, computer science and, and, and teach them how to do cool things. They also have all the kind of STEM that ambassador programs, um, there's Coda Dojo, and then also there is increasingly this uh, push in the actual education space with the curriculum through the exam boards. Now, um, what we would ideally want to do is, is hook up with the sort of code club and, and code dojo equivalents that are working in the US. And I think from what I've seen, there, are, there aren't that many uh, sort of national schemes. It seems to be more sort of city by city or state by state schemes that are working there. Part of what I'm doing when I'm traveling around is trying to meet up with them. So you know there's things like, for example, First Robotics, uh, where they, they are starting to use Raspberry Pis and various schemes there. Um, but, but it's also trying to understand the other schemes that might exist in the, uh, the US, you know, the kind of STEAM and STEMnet equivalents. Uh, and, and we're trying to make those links and, and make that happen. And I think it's a case of us working with them to get the Pis and the materials and to share with the, the US, uh, UK equivalents, and for them to then start doing the groundwork so that you know when either ourselves or they start the conversation on a sort of uh, a school board level then actually you know there's already success stories we can point to and there's already kids using the pies and there's already that that kind of knowledge um you know we the the, the number of uh, pies sold in the us per person relative to that of europe is a lot lower um now that doesn't make any sense because uh you know there's there's i think there's arguably more Hacker spaces uh, than the, you know per person in the U.S. and in the U.K. You know, there's obviously just as many people in education. There's you know just uh, just as many uh, well, proportionally, um, uh, and so there doesn't seem to be any real reason why that should be, other than the fact that you know we haven't communicated our message sufficiently and we haven't explained what it is that we're trying to do, um, and so you know maybe once there's a bit more knowledge that actually yes you can go and 
go into a school and teach computer science with a $25 computer, that maybe some people will be inspired to go and start those schemes and start making those contacts. Um, uh, but you know, this, this is as much a learning exercise for us to understand how to best do that over here. Um, you know, as I say, I, I, I'm not a teacher and you know, I'm not an expert on that side of things. I know, I know what I think we should be doing. And I think on the university level, we're, we're seeing a lot of Raspberry Pis being picked up. I think we just need to trickle that down into schools and to understand how to do that. Pi is running MAME, <laughs> which okay. in and of itself isn't super, super, you know, technical or whatnot, but it's uh, enclosed an entirely uh, custom Lego arcade. Amazing. So <laughs> that's the fun part. <laughs> that was very cool. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. You had mentioned uh, first. Um, so first is really great. One of the downsides to see you is these really expensive national instruments hardware, yeah. which is great during the competition, and maybe you have that when you're in college and. But when you're not in school or after school, you've learned this really expensive software and hardware system, right? Yeah, right. And it would be cool if there was something like the Pi that they could transition into. Agree. And I, I, I think it's a case of making the people who are running those kind of schemes aware of the Pi and aware that there is the support um, and aware that you can actually buy them now because it's amazing how many people we meet who go, oh yeah, you value, you know, there's no stock in the US or something. And it's like, well, yeah, that was true like 12 months ago. Um, and uh, you can buy cameras now, you can buy everything. Um, and so, uh, yeah, hopefully as a result of, of doing these kind of talks and speaking to people and uh, I'm also uh, having meetings uh, with people while I'm out here on the kind of school board and um, the various sort of schemes like we, I was talking about before on that kind of level as well. You know, I'm, I'm not out here to try and sell the Pi. I'm out here to let people know that they can buy a computer for $25. I think it's, it's a very different kind of thing. Um, and it's just about letting people know that that, that option exists and, and then kind of leaving them to run with it, to be honest. I think part of that is is a misplaced fear. Actually, I think you know um, the Raspberry Pi in some ways is designed to be uh, more challenging than it is comfortable. You know, it is kind of designed to say, actually, you know, you can go and do this. Yes, we don't sell it without a case. You know, you can hold electronics; it's not going to explode. And it's amazing how many people. You know, I, I carry these things like in my back pocket and just loose in my bag and things, and they're pretty much fine. And you'll pass it to people, and they'll be kind of like very ginger with it. And you know, we we're starting to worry about static, and I'm just kind of rubbing my shoes on the carpet and not really very stressed. Um, and I think you know, it, it is meant to be challenging, and it is meant to sort of push people to go. Actually, you know, it's twenty-five dollars. If you solder to the wrong bit and, and break it, you know, that's not a disaster. Um, and I think we do, um, you know, I, I agree that I think there probably is a market for people wanting sort of plug and play solutions. But, you know, I'm not sure whether or not those are actually the best, the best educational solutions that are available. Um, I, I suspect that someone will end up producing third party plug and play robotics systems. But, you know, you can still get kind of jumper leads and hook it up to a stepper motor and make a very simple robot in about 10 lines of Python. And I think you learn a lot more by doing that generically than learning how to use a particular bit of software. Um, you know, I think that's important. Cool. Being in a hacker space, I'm interested if you know anything about the artists in residence that you have now hired. Yes, we do. Yeah, so uh, Rachel Rains has, has just gone board as our artist in residence. Um, so, so we think that the art projects are very important to us. Um, I, I often joke that uh, you know, a good art project should be sort of um, understandable without any, uh, you know, much or any explanation. And a good engineering project um, shouldn't be. Uh, and, yes. and, <laughs> yeah, 
Uh, you certainly kind of it feels like that sometimes, right? And 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 I think the art projects are, are, are very valuable because you can show people shiny things and they can relate to them very quickly. You know, they see something that does something. It's an art installation. You know, they're designed so that on first glance, without any you know existing body of knowledge, you can recognise it as being a cool thing and you can understand vaguely what it does. And so uh, these kids can be inspired by it. You know, we can do very clever things with sort of stepper motors or RFID or writing kernel drivers. But the problem is actually to explain why that's cool, um, you know, you need like a week. Um, and and so, so the art's very, very important to us. It's very useful for doing that initial step of saying that computer science is interesting and is relevant. Um, and so hopefully uh, Rachel is, is, is going to work on some projects to do that. Uh, she already has uh, some in the past. I know she's, she's working on some new ones. Um, but you know, uh, alongside that, she, uh, part of her job is also communicating to other artists that actually a Raspberry Pi is a good platform for this. And again, you know, is that distracting us away from our mission of education? No, that's a uh, kind of a, a side tangent which is going to produce the uh, the shiny things, which are then going to feed back into our main goal, which is inspiring people. Great. Well, I think, um, yeah. Uh, <coughs> you know, we, when you talk about the pie being as inexpensive as it is, um, I've been a lot of thinking about the pie as, as sort of an ultra affordable computing platform and how it could uh, perhaps. Wow. Open up the world of computing to groups of people who really haven't had the money to get into it. Yeah. Um, what do you know about the people who have tried to exploit the pie's affordability that way? Yeah, I mean, so, uh, so that kind of links back to my earlier point where, you know, I genuinely think that with, with $25, uh, and an internet connection, and probably the other things you have lying about. And if not, you know, it's still going to be probably less than less than a hundred, certainly less than fifty dollars to set Pi up. Um, you know, there is no reason why you, you couldn't. You don't have enough uh, information and ability to go and start your own business and earn a million dollars. You know, I think that's very powerful because actually, you have kids in their bedrooms who can buy a Pi for twenty-five dollars. They can go and write. You know, whatever it is that they're interested in, a bit of software. You know, we have a, a, a Pi store, a software store. You know, uh, one of these days, someone's going to, some kid's going to write a game. Might not even be very complicated, but just have a, you know, really brilliant sort of uh, concept. And that's going to be popular, and it's going to earn them some money. Okay, you know, they, they might not make, you know, millions of dollars out of it, but, you know, you could probably feasibly earn a, a, a living, you know, out of writing those bits of software and writing those games. And... And that's a very powerful thing. You know, it's a very powerful thing that actually, instead of saying, you know, you need to buy all these textbooks at twenty-five dollars each, or more than twenty-five dollars, you know, and and uh, spend all this money on on an expensive education, otherwise you can't be a programmer. You know, actually, it's kind of stopped back to being sort of a, an internet connection. Twenty-five dollars is probably all you need to, you know, make websites and and earn some money. You know, I, I you know, obviously we're we're backed by the university. You know, I think the formal education is still very important. A bit hypocritically, but um, but, but you know I, I think that um, you know for some people that is that is difficult to do because of the debt. And I think yes, I think having a computer that's twenty five dollars is going to mean that a lot more people can go and, and do the self learning that otherwise maybe wasn't available to them. Yep. How many Raspberry Pis do you have around your house doing various things? So. Um, the ones in my house normally are in my rucksack, which is because I'm, I'm like, I actually got a week at home between traveling for things. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I spend a lot of my time in the office when I'm uh, back in Cambridge. And, um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of stuff in the office in Cambridge. We kind of need to tidy it a bit more. Um, it makes this hack space look very organized. Um, but uh, it's funny, people come to visit the office because uh, they... They think it's going to be uh, some sort of like uh, Willy Wonka uh, sort of factory. Um, you know, the Raspberry Pis are all manufactured, obviously, in Wales. Um, I remember when we, we first moved in, uh, there was kind of three of us working in the office, and we kind of had a couple of just normal desks and chairs, and I just like, had my laptop. I don't really 
use anything else. Um, and it kind of looked like it could have been an office anywhere in the world. You know, we could have been accountancy or whatever. And, uh, and Wired actually came to do an article. And I think they're expecting lots of really exciting, <laughs> shiny things. And there's just kind of a bunch of guys sat at their laptops. Um, and so after that, uh, Liz went out and bought lots of very random, sort of like inflatable portal turrets and things, <laughs> just so it looked like we might actually do things in the office. Um, so, see us. Bye. So. I graduated from college project, but I, in more of an application, I, I used a uh, Raspbian MC and downloaded a bunch of karaoke uh, videos from, <laughs> from YouTube and basically used it as a uh, karaoke machine. <laughs> cool. Uh, cool. I tried to put a, a, a USB audio uh, driver into it, but it doesn't support that yet, or it didn't when I tried yeah, it. Yeah, it might now work. Um. Yeah, no, it, it, it may now work if you have Top of Tree uh, with RPI update. It'd be interesting to know if it, if it doesn't, actually. Yeah. As long as you keep it away from the aquarium. Exactly. I'll just go back and tell Jonathan we've got something else he needs to fix on USB. Um, what, what software uh, cat package do you use to actually design the board itself? Um, so, uh, so the board was, was all designed by... Um, by Pete Lomas. Pete Lomas is, uh, sort of runs a um, sort of a contract design uh, company. Um, I believe they were doing it all in uh, Explorer uh, Mental Graphics. Um, we also use, well, we use lots. We use Allegro. We use lots of different packages, to be honest. Um, yeah, not as any specific endorsements there, but just we, we tend to use the various uh, different ones. Yeah, so, so the schematics are out. Um, we have kind of uh, floor diagrams and things which are out. Um, a lot of people have asked for the stack up. Um, we haven't released the stack up, mostly because it's, it's not very useful. Because the problem is you can't actually get hold of the, the Broadcom chip. So you know, you're not going to be able to do much with it. Um, you know, the schematics are actually the useful and valuable thing. Um, I suspect we'll end up releasing the, the stack up at some point, but it's it's just it's not been very valuable, so we haven't got around to it. What's the main source for the schematics? Um, so it's hosted somewhere on our website. I don't know what the URL is off the top of my head. I suspect Googling Raspberry Pi schematics will probably, will probably <laughs> there, do the trick. things on eLinux. So like the wiki on eLinux? Um, yeah, I mean, you know, we suffer from the, the standard sort of open source project issue in the fact that uh, there's a lot of information scattered very far and wide. Um, it is a worry because the problem is, is that people go and write tutorials and then they get good SEO rankings and then we change something and then of course people go and read tutorials which are out of date. It's been unfortunate. You know, when we release noobs there's still a lot of people who go, you know, do you still have this bug that we might have had like 12 months ago? Um, I'm not, there's no obvious way to fix those kind of problems. It's, it's unfortunate that when we start using Google as a as a general indexer of knowledge, that you know, it'd be good to have some way to kind of deprecate stuff as it as it died. But on the other hand, we're very grateful to the fact that, that the community is writing a wealth of tutorials and resources for us. And again, the reason why we're slow to change things because you know we we don't really want to break all of this stuff unless we absolutely have to. Um, I think that these things seem to happen in ways. I mean, I I was in in the uh, late 60s, early 70s, when they had the uh, uh, the the time that the uh, uh, microprocessors were first coming out. There was a wave of, of, of uh, development of the systems there. That you had you know, Altair, you had the Atari, you had the uh, Commodore, Jim. Uh, I guess the uh, the internet connection of the first uh, bulletin board system and the internet uh, also brought a series later. Now we have the, uh, the uh, processor on a chip, uh, or the, the microcontroller on a chip. Uh, it's, uh, Doing another, starting another wave, 
actually into the way of somewhat. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, what, what's interesting is I think we've, we, you know, if you look at the trends recently, it has been sort of keeping costs stable, but providing more power for the costs. I mean, it, it kind of felt like there was this unpleasant circle where we were making less and less optimized software that was more and more bulky. So we needed faster processes to support it. And, uh, and then you did those at the same cost and nobody really won. Um, and I think what's happening now is actually um, cost is the, you know, the, the major uh, player, you know, the major factor in, 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 in how things are progressing rather than performance. Um, you know, if you look at ARM processors, uh, you know, the various phones that are coming out, they're producing increases in hardware faster than the software engineers can actually exploit. You know, uh, if you look at the, the level of optimization that we have on our software, and when you think uh, when David Brabham wrote Elite back in the day, you know, he had to know every single bit of how to use his memory, how to use every trick possible to really get the best performance out of it. And you know, as things have got faster and faster, we've kind of got more and more sloppy. I mean, Scratch, when we first ported Scratch to Pi, um, every time you changed a single element in the frame, it redrew the entire frame. Right? And it did that because on an x86 machine, it was just like, ah, who cares? Right? <laughs> and then you port it to an arm, and suddenly it's like, why would I move this sprite by one pixel? Do I redraw the entire frame? <laughs> you know? And you realize that something's gone very badly wrong. And I think. Um, I think what's going to happen is there's going to be a, a, a push to actually do the software well to support the platforms. And I think there's a lot of value yet to be exploited there. And I think, you know, you look at the, the power consumption of recent phones. I think Samsung's got an eight core phone coming out. Look at the power consumption that's going to have when you have, I mean, okay, you can only have four cores running at a time, but, uh, you know, it's like actually maybe what we need is some optimized software that's running on on like some lower power hardware that's cheaper. That feels like a better thing to have. And I think that's what the Raspberry Pi is proving. You know, there's a lot of things that you can do on a single core 700 megahertz arm that I think you know, people prior to the Raspberry Pi probably thought you needed hundreds of cores to do. Uh, you know, and I, it's, it's, it's not necessarily true. You, know, you, can, you can get by. It's good enough. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting. It was funny talking to the Argon boys about it, because they were saying you know, they have a lot of problems with schedulers. You know, how they can actually uh, issue um, the, the processors with work efficiently. Um, you know, and they were saying, schedulers aren't that advanced. People don't really know how to do it. And the big problem with Big Little is no one's really figured out how to do the scheduling properly to actually use the architecture well. And so you know, you're getting these eight core um, processors, and people are going, oh, eight cores, that's amazing. Whereas what they really should be doing is, you know, this has some really optimized scheduling algorithms. But like, again, you know, the problem is, is, is that it's not a very good marketing point. Um, so, be interesting to see. I, I genuinely don't know what they're going to do with those eight cores, other than make a lot of heat. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, one thing I'll put in my spare time is to read up and to understand the history of early computing. Not specifically early, like the, when we first started out in the 40s, um, but in the, in the 70s kind of type, time frame with, um, with the Apple and Wozniak, his, his genius, and the, the hardware specs, and just the way the Apple one and the Apple II was designed. Um, when you look at Commodore, how they're able, you know, kind of like how and your companies start to make it cheap enough so that everyone can buy some pride, you know, stuff like that. But then, you know, I, I was kind of bored with U.S. manufacturers, and I started looking at British manufacturers, and then I realized, oh my goodness, you guys have also your own little spectrum. Oh, yeah. If you don't mind the pun spectrum. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> there, there are a lot of crazy computers that came out of Cambridge. Uh, and one of, the, one of the designers that really impressed me that was a uh, that was British, was a uh, Sir Clive Sinclair. Yeah. Um, brilliant man. Um, um, and I noticed that some of your design cues on your Raspberry Pi actually come from Sir. Uh, if you look at it closely, yeah. You know his all his, his computer. Everyone else, they had all these chips designed, these processors, and then these co-processors. And so Sir Clive Sinclair just had one processor, and this like you know how the calculator has that gel. Um, yeah. Keyboard, he had that, and then he said, hey, less than 100 bucks, let's see if people can make some stuff. And, yeah. um, you know, do you guys think any design? Uh, so, so um, bear in mind that our trustees are all of the generation where they probably own Sinclair's. I think there is a certain amount of 
inevitable um, nostalgia that probably came through when they were, you know, I mean, the Raspberry Pi basically came out because, you know, Eben had like those, I, I'm not sure exactly which, which one he had when he was a kid, but, you know, exactly. They had one of those computers and he was like, yeah, I, I miss not having one of those computers, so I think we should make one again, um, you know, which is, you know, the start of all good entrepreneurship stories, really. Um, so. You know, nothing, like how there was this general buzz, and I love reading about that time period um, where, where everyone was excited and everyone was making their own things, and you can make one at home. Um, and I'm seeing, especially with Kickstarter now and things like that, people are just, people are buying into uh, and investing into these companies like Parallel Longer. They're making their own supercomputer credit card size, uh, you know, 64, I don't know what they're going to do with that, 64, 64 core. core. For um, $200 and like credit card, I mean, you guys spark all that. Do you think it's exciting? And what do you see in the future of that being you know, hardware? Yeah, I don't think that's what I I think, you know, we've sufficiently disrupted the market to prove that you can do this cheaply. And I think as a result, you know, you look at other people who are making single board computers and, and you look at uh, how their prices might have changed since the Raspberry Pi has been released. I can think of a number of notable examples I'm not going to name. Um, you know, I, and I, I, I'm pretty confident that we probably caused that to happen. <laughs> you know, and if more people are producing cheap computers um, at lower margins, then that's a good thing. Um, you know, and I really do think the next, the next you know, big... A uh, big boom is going to be in, in in hardware just because people can do it cheaply, and we've proved it. You know, we've we've, we've scaled to one and a half million units with like a seven-man team. You know, you can do it. Um, so great. Okay, well, I think that's uh, probably wraps everything up. Thanks everyone for coming.